just sit back and enjoy this, and you don't really have to quite memorize it. I'm just trying to introduce you to the terms that physicists use and, uh, and the, termino the terminology they use. But um, our universe is actually quite simple. It's, there's only three basic components. Uh, there's just matter particles and force particles, and the space-time on which these matter and force particles interact with one another to create everything we see around us. And in the, in the force particles, there's some that everybody's fam familiar with. Um, photons that carry light, that they carry, the, that's the electromagnetic force. Um, uh, some you're not familiar with, like gluons, uh, uh, maybe not familiar. Uh, gluons carry the uh, strong nuclear force which holds the nucleus of the atom together. And there's uh, weak nuclear, uh, weak particles of the weak force. And uh, then there's gravity. And, uh, and then on the matter particles, so there's really only four basic forces in nature. One of the really nice things about physics, anybody who's considering a second or third career, um, there's not that much to memorize. <laughs> and uh, so I recommend it. <laughs> And uh, so um, on the matter particles, again, there's very, very few. There are, believe it or not, there are only four fundamental matter particles that make up 99.999% of all the matter in the universe. And those are electrons and quarks and neutrinos. That's it. And we'll go do a little more here. And this is uh, four-dimensional space-time that I'm showing. And, uh, and I'm just going to... Uh, show, I'm going to illustrate the forces in uh, these slides here. In, the, in this first uh, slide here, I show the, a basic atom. It's just a hydrogen atom. It, it's an isotope of hydrogen uh, called deuterium. Uh, the simplest hydrogen atom would just be a proton and, uh, and an electron, but I just showed the neutron just to show that it's, you can have neutrons in the nucleus too. And, uh, but anyway, the key thing to point, uh, we need here is that um, it's the electromagnetic force that holds the electron to the proton in orbit there. And, uh, and then the proton itself is made up of, s of smaller particles and the neutron too, uh, called quarks. And they're held together by the strong nuclear force. And we just go through this kind of quick. Um, uh, so anyway, this is the end, all, all protons and neutrons have three quarks in them, and the, and the gluons carry what they call color charge between the quarks that hold the nucleus together. So here I am again in my usual pose. In 2007, I was doing my usual pose in the middle of a crop circle, and I was taken. And uh, all I knew was when I woke up from whatever happened, and I know now, but at the time, I opened my eyes, and there was mosquitoes, and I was moving them around. But as soon as the mosquitoes left, I kept going like this, and all of a sudden I realized I was seeing something I had never seen before. And I didn't realize that I had been recalibrated. So my eyes could see plasma, and I was seeing these things everywhere in the sky. And they move really quickly, and the sky was full of them. And I, I knew I wasn't hallucinating, because I don't drink. And, um, I was seeing this for the first time, and of course I'm on my back, so there's an awful lot of sky, but they were everywhere. And in the third crop circle, when I laid on my back and looked at the plasma, I actually saw, and I'm positive because I sketched them, that off the side of some of these circles, which is a small circle on the inside and a big circle on the outside, some of them are clear circle, clear circle, but some of them are dark inner circle and clear outer circle. But what I saw that was the most amazing was that some of them had an egg sac that looked like this on the outside, and it was full of eggs. So whatever they are, they reproduce with eggs. Uh, I believe they're plasma, but I am just guessing. So all I know is, all of a sudden, I was really different. I was really, really different. And it doesn't take a great eye to look at a crop circle and see something more amazing like a 3D image. This is gonna be a group of crop circles that as you look at them, you can see the 3D nature of their intention.
Can you see it? That's flat. That's on the ground. That's dry, brittle wheat when it's tan. Time tunnels, wormholes, one after another. And when you start taking your time to look at the crop circles, it doesn't leave much doubt in your mind. That's flat, looks 3D to me. Can you see the 3D? Yeah, I'm up here looking, but I'm pretty sure that that was their intention to say to us, it's not what you see, it's what you don't see. Now, one of the main focuses of astrobiology research is on the origin of life on Earth. And the reason is because if you want to know about the possibility of life on other worlds, you should first understand how life got here so you'll know whether it's possible for life to have arisen similarly in other worlds. From laboratory experiments, studies of early life, and so on on Earth, we're getting quite confident that getting life on a planet with the right conditions is probably not that difficult. Now, we can't be certain because we haven't made life in the laboratory yet, but it certainly seems like it ought to be possible. Another way of looking at this question, how hard is it to get life on a planet like Earth, is to look at the history of Earth. And on this graph here, you can see a timeline. The present is over here on the right, and now we go back four and a half billion years to the birth of the Earth. And if you look at this graph, you'll see at 3.85 billion years here is the oldest evidence of life on Earth. But if you look straight up here, you see this red bar? And that red bar represents what we call the heavy bombardment. And remember, I told you that our solar system formed from the spinning cloud of gas, particles condensed, and eventually built up to form planets. Well, there was a lot of stuff that built up. Most, much of that stuff is still around in the form of asteroids and comets. They're sort of the leftover building blocks of planet formation. But probably a lot more was there originally, but it crashed into planets, and so it's not there anymore. So if you think about that, that means that early in the solar system's history, the young planets must have been getting bombarded by large asteroids frequently. Now, we're talking about scales of billions of years, so frequently might mean every 10 million years. But that's enough, because when you do the calculations, you'll find that given the kinds of objects that must have been around at the time, the size of them, some of them 100 kilometers across, much, much bigger than the 10 kilometer across asteroid thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, these ones 100 kilometers across, when they hit the Earth, they release so much energy that it would have completely vaporized the oceans and melted the upper part of Earth's crust which means if there was life on Earth during this early period, then whenever one of those big things hit, it was very likely that the life on Earth would have been wiped out. Which means if there was life on Earth back then, we're not gonna be able to find evidence. This is a great one. This is definitely one that's, uh, you know, a president within my lifetime, uh, you know, Ronnie said, uh, in 1974, reported this to the Wall Street Journal. I looked out the window and saw this white light. It was zigzagging around. We followed it for several minutes. It was a bright greenish white light. We followed it to Bakersfield, and all of a sudden, to our utter amazement, it went straight up into the heavens. Uh, and yes, this was 1974, um, but the story supposedly took place while he was governor, uh, and then he reiterated it after leaving, uh, after leaving office. Um, and he actually also had a second sighting in, in the 1950s. Uh, after showing up late for a dinner party um, that was going to be attended by other celebrities, apparently Ronald and Nancy Reagan said they saw a UFO. Uh, this was, okay, Kitty Kelly was supposedly there, Lucille Ball and Steve Allen, and uh, Patty Davis reported this story in her own book that, um, and said that he was fascinated with stories about unidentified flying objects and the possibility of life on other worlds. So that's kind of two uh, Reagan uh, stories.
Did that impact him? Did that impact his career? No. No. Okay. So there's a conversation to be had there, you know, Kucinich, Carter, Reagan, uh, you know, back and forth, why it would impact Reagan or not impact Reagan versus Carter. That's one you can have uh, with me afterwards at, uh, at the table, but it's an interesting one. Of course, Muhammad Ali, he was not the only one floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Well, maybe not stinging, but at least floating. Uh, because he said that uh, if you look into the sky in the early morning, you see him playing tag between the stars, and it would see them visible over New York City's Central Park while on a jog. Although I have to tell you, I live in New York City, and although this was a while back, seeing anything in the sky is kind of difficult at times because of all the light pollution. But um, supposedly claimed to see, have seen up to 16 uh, UFOs. And um, you know it was a bright light appearing over his head and moving along with him. Um, but he said, hey, it's no big deal. He's the greatest. So of course he would have seen the most number of UFOs and claimed to see them all the time. Uh, this source. I find is a little bit questionable because I think this has moved into the arena of urban legend now. I still like it because, you know, it's, it's coming from a guy that, uh, you know, is, pretty, has, has, is a good storyteller. Uh, but I do question this one a little bit. Uh, and again, Central Park, I don't see anything in the sky above Central Park when I'm there. There's no question that there's been an exchange of meteorites between the planets. We find Martian meteorites. On Mars, there are Earth meteorites. So certainly, it seems conceivable that life, if it got started on one place, would have traveled to the other. So it's easy enough to imagine that Mars got life first, although actually the most likely candidate for life first is Venus, because the sun was cooler in the past, so Venus would have probably had Earth-like conditions first, and maybe it spread the life to Earth and Mars. And yes, I think it's a near certainty that there's liquid water on Mars today. I don't know anyone who disputes that. Um, not on the surface, because the air pressure is too low for the water to be stable, but underground or under the ice caps, certainly you would expect to find liquid water on Mars. So if life got there in the past, either by starting there or by being seated there. It seems very reasonable to imagine that it's still there today. Now those same calculations that allow you to see that in some cases a meteorite could travel from Earth to Mars or vice versa in a decade or a couple decades, which certainly we know life can survive, um, they tell you that it would be many, many millions of years to travel to another star system. And we do not think or that we know of any life that can survive that long. So I think panspermia within the solar system, yes, between stars, I would say the evidence is no right now. Well, I'd like to comment on that. So, uh, it, it, one of the things that's fascinating is that in glaciers, uh, life can remain viable for very long periods of time. David Gilichinsky obtained ices from the Beacon Valley of Antarctica and these were clearly Miocene ices because a volcano had erupted and thrown volcanic ash onto a glacier and the volcanic ash was on the surface of the glacier and he took samples of the glacier from underneath the boulders and ice. If that glacial ice had melted since the volcanic explosion in the Miocene 8.3 million years ago, then that, those boulders and that ash would have fallen through the, uh, through the solid glacial ice, or which would have been turned into water and would have disappeared. And in that Beacon Valley ice, David recovered bacteria that were still viable and were culturable. So we know that for time periods at least of the order of a few million years, bacteria can remain alive if in frozen state. <laughs>